In 2008, adventurer Mark Beaumont smashed the world record, cycling around the world in 194 days. Now he's got an even more ambitious dream, to cycle the length of the longest mountain range on Earth, the Rockies and the Andes. This epic 13,000-mile expedition is taking Mark from Alaska to the bottom of Argentina. And not content with that, he's attempting something never done before, combining the cycle with climbs of the highest mountains in North and South America. Ah. It's a nine-month expedition, and this time, Central America will take Mark's body and mind beyond anything he's experienced before. Oh, I'm not sure about the humidity, it's the... I think it's the most humid I've ever ridden in. A land of extremes, where people of passion embrace both life... Viva Mexico! ...and death. Yeah. yeah, number one, yeah, no, it's not a sport. It's, it's not a sport. It's a spectacle of death. From the dangers? I know it just takes one wrong place, wrong time, wrong person, and you're in a really serious situation. To the downpour. I'm from Scotland. I'm used to cycling in the rain. <laughs> but this stuff's something else. This is The Man Who Cycled the Americas. So far, Mark has been alone on the road for 98 days. Everything is about to change. In about a mile's time, I'm about to cross into Mexico. And, uh, well, for the next four or five months, I'll be having to try and get by with the limited Spanish I've got. And, um, yeah, I think culturally everything will be very different. Since he left Alaska, he cycled over 4,000 miles, filming the journey himself. He's now approaching the US-Mexican border, just west of the twin cities of El Paso and Juarez. Leaving the safety of the US behind, the region he's about to enter is plagued by violence, drug smuggling, and murder. The, the reality is that, you know, there is a bit of trepidation about heading into Mexico. Just two days ago, 18 people were murdered in Juarez. It's really the borderlands that the drug cartels are fighting over. Mark's crossing the border into the Mexican state of Chihuahua. Here, the dangers are considered so high, he must be joined by an escort, local photojournalist Julian Cardona. Before Mark sets off through Mexico, Julian gives him a tour of his home city, Juarez. 2,000 people were murdered here last year alone. The city has about 200,000 drug addicts now, probably at 10% uh, of the population. With the kidnap and drugs business fueling up to 20 killings a day, this is officially the most dangerous city on Earth. And, and there have been many murders related with kidnappings and with extortion. You don't pay the kidnap uh, the money for your, your kidnap uh, relative. He may or she may be killed. With Julian on his tail, Mark safely on the outskirts of Juarez, but he's not out of the danger zone yet. He's still got to pass through the heart of the Chihuahua region. Here, close to a thousand people were kidnapped last year. Hola. The danger is very real. I'm not kidding myself. Having valuable equipment, 
even just having my camera out and uh, being witness to something I shouldn't, you know, a crime, makes me much higher risk than and much more valuable than a lot of other Mexicans around me. It's very hard not to stand out. If, if anyone was out for me, if anyone decided I was a kidnapped target, there is nothing or very, very little that either myself or Julian could do. He's not a guard. He's, not, he's certainly not an armed guard. I've just cycled into a section where I can see for the next mile or so there are huge billboards with um, with mugshots of people and their their wanted signs, uh, you know, put up by the state, put up by the, the the police or army, whoever's looking for them, for for people who are involved in kidnappings in the in the area. So the first one I've come across is the De La Cruz family, and there's a one million peso reward out for for their for their capture. And these are these are people who are involved in kidnapping in the area. And uh, yeah, if it wasn't for things like this, I don't think I would know that it was a dangerous area at all. Mark and Julian have now travelled 180 miles into the danger zone. And so far, no problems. As evening approaches, it's time to eat. And in Mexico, that means hot and spicy. Julian knows these little towns quite well. And this town is famous for its cheese and for its quesadillas. And uh, he said before we go and check into a hotel, because I'm not allowed to camp in this area as well, uh, he had to stop and get a quesadilla. So we're just stopped off and uh, we're going to see what the local food is. I have a funny feeling it's going to be too hot for me though. So what have you got? Uh, the quesadilla with a sodero. So is this very, very spicy? Very, very spicy. Would I could try it? No. <laughs> The next morning, it seems there's no escaping Julian's passion for all things fiery. He's found a nearby chili farm and is keen to show Mark how the Chihuahua region produces Mexico's hottest chilies. They are selling jalapeno. Come on. A vast amount of chili here. I can't even eat one, so there's millions here. My, uh, my idea of hell. <laughs> In this part of Mexico, fresh chilies just aren't spicy enough. So they dry them out over hot fires in the sun for five days. The result is known as a chipotle chili. So spicy, it's reserved for the hottest sauces. In Mexico, is it a test of if you are a real man, if you like to eat the hot chilies? Como a decirle que es una prueba esto, comera. <laughs> For the breakfast. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think he needs some water. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Gracias. <laughs> On day 101, Mark's arriving at the state capital, Chihuahua City. It was here in 1811 that a priest, Father Hidalgo, was held captive and executed. He was the hero who inspired the revolution against the Spanish government, leading to the independence of the Mexican people. But it's a much more recent memorial that grabs Mark's attention. This rather strange looking uh, monument is actually a protest it's been put up here against the government to um, highlight the, the problems of the killings in the area. Each nail represents a girl, a woman, that has been killed in Juarez, in the city of Juarez, in the last few years. Uh, ni una mas literally means no more. So it's people saying that, you know, no more women should, should be killed and caught up in 
in the violence. It's, uh, it's pretty sad. Mark is now leaving the high-risk stage of Chihuahua. Time to say goodbye to Julian. Do you think this is the border? Uh, I think we are close to... <laughs> I should keep going that way. <laughs> hey, okay. Thank you. Thank take, you. Take care. Take care of you. And uh, I will see you again. Okay. Come to Scotland. I will, I will go. I have friends <laughs> in London. And Scotland now. Okay. <laughs> From here on, Mark's alone, and he's been warned he has to stay on his guard throughout Mexico. Having been climbing steadily for a week, Mark's reached the 16th century city of Zacatecas. It's perched high on Mexico's central plateau at nearly 8,000 feet. His timing couldn't have been better. It's the Independence Day celebrations, and the hot-blooded Mexicans sure know how to party. I have absolutely no idea where I'm going, but it's always a good policy in any new city to get to the high point and get your bearings, so that's what I'm doing. Before it gets dark and before the party really starts, I'm seeing if I can find my way through these houses up, uh, up these steps. It seems to be fairly straightforward. Whoa. I hope there are fireworks. I hope there are fireworks. It sounds like a, a war going on around me. But uh, I've left the... <laughs> I've left the town centre now. And I've no idea where I'm going, but these steps look like they're going up the hillside. Sounds like I'm getting pretty close. I hope they're fireworks. If they've actually, if they're actually firing guns up here, I should probably be careful. They sound pretty realistic, don't they? I still, I still don't know whether they are real or not. I'm, I'm, I'm safely behind the guns now, and they're just firing them off over the city. But um, I've no idea. They look pretty real and they're loading with something. They might just be blanks. Yeah, they must be blanks, they must be blanks. You wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't fire rifles over the city because the shot's gonna come down somewhere. Look at this little kid. At 11 p.m. on the 15th of September, people all across Mexico unite gathering as a proud nation to celebrate their independence from Spanish rule. Viva Mexico! Viva! Viva Mexico! Viva! I can't believe how close those fireworks are. I mean, they're, they're happening, you know, within... I guess 30, 40 meters. And they're shooting right overhead, but uh, nobody seems worried. It makes them that bit more impressive how close they are. Mark hasn't touched alcohol for four months, but tonight, this is tequila time. <laughs> right, so we're doing three or four, yeah? You are doing 30 or 40, I don't know. <laughs> Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, siete, ocho, nueve, diez. What night? 
Uh, I've just woken up. It's uh, nine o'clock in the morning, and um, well, these Mexicans certainly know how to party. Uh, I've woken because there's the sound of a marching band outside. It's relentless. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no rest. You hear that? Uh, so I'm gonna get up and go and see what's happening outside. Shake off this tequila. Nursing a hangover, Marx received an invitation to attend an event that should sober him up. He's about to discover that Mexico's love of life goes hand in hand with the celebration of death. Gracias. Mark has a rare chance to witness one of Mexico's premier bullfights. Is it a different, uh, do they call it yeah. a sport? Yeah, number one, yeah, no, it's not a sport. It's, it's not a sport. It's a spectacle of death, and hopefully you won't see death today. But it's a close to the liver. So, so, it's, so, so, so in terms of this, you're saying I'm unlikely to see death today. They don't always kill the, the animals. Oh, no, they kill the animals, but they don't always kill the bullfighters. And what oh, you have to realize... They sometimes that, do, though. Oh, yes, yes. And if a, guy, a bullfighter gets killed, the next one takes his bull and the one that belongs to him. Everyone is going to get two bulls. Two bullfighters get killed. One guy has to kill all six bulls. So, so, so the, ev the, event, stop. the event does not stop if a bullfighter mm -hmm. dies? No, death is just temporary. It's going to go away. I definitely needed to get back on my bike after that. It was not my idea of fun at all. I mean, you got to appreciate it for its, um, you know, its history and their, the theatre which goes with it. But uh, it's impossible to escape the fact that uh, it's just downright animal cruelty. I mean, it really is a, an unfair fight and it's a, it's a nasty end. And uh, so being part of that big crowd, those bloodthirsty vultures just enjoying kill after kill was uh, a little bit much for me. From Zacatecas, Mark is just 400 miles to the Pacific Ocean. In his way stands the Sierra Madre Occidental Mountains, a continuation of the American Rockies. Here the peaks reach more than 10 and a half thousand feet. <laughs> In a country of extremes, the mountain roads are no exception. When you've got big passes to cycle in the US and Canada, they tend to wind their way up quite gradual roads, no steep gradients, where the Mexicans build their roads going straight up the mountain. So, using my lowest gears for the first time and just uh, plodding through some pretty big days here. These, these climbs are steep and I've already done two today which were about 15 miles each. So uh, it's just the altitude, it's the ascent. <sighs> uh, Mark endures eight days of these leg-zapping hill climbs 
conquering thousands of feet in ascent. From here, there's only one way to the Pacific. It's definitely all worth it for the downhills. Look at this. Food is always on Mark's mind. Regularly devouring six meals a day, his mission is not just quantity, but food that packs enough calories. I'll head in and see if I can find something big enough and uh, not spicy, which I can uh, fuel myself up on. Mark needs to consume a high-fat, carb and protein diet. So he's looking for foods like chicken, pasta and pizza. Unfortunately, his hunger is not matched by his Spanish. Do you have um, pizza? Pizza, ahorita no tenemos pizza. Déjate muestro la... OK. Pero, pero no pizza. OK, OK, OK. <laughs> OK, es que te digo otra cosa. Tenemos también camarones o este... a la mantequilla, filete a la mantequilla, camarones a la mantequilla, este... <laughs> no me entiendes. Uh, I don't know. This is the challenge. I have absolutely no idea when it comes to further arrangements, what, what they're saying. Um... Mark eventually makes his order. Although what it is, and whether it's going to help satisfy his daily appetite for 6,000 calories, is a mystery. Here, there seems to be options with everything, and I can't do options here. Um, so there's this wonderful debate every time I order anything. <laughs> It's a challenge. <laughs> Got to keep my spirits up because uh, it gets a little bit frustrating. With a bit of luck, Mark somehow ordered a large portion of not too spicy chicken fajitas. Good for a thousand calories and a few hours of energy. Hit the jackpot with that. It is a bit of a lottery getting food out here yet. <laughs> Despite the warmth of reception from the locals, Mark knows this is dangerous territory. So all the way through Mexico, he's been staying in cheap inns and motels to reduce the risk of kidnap. But tonight, he's way short of the nearest town. This uh, looks like it'll be the first night camping in uh, Mexico. Mark's been advised that if he does camp, it's essential to get off the road and out of sight by nightfall. You know, there's obviously a little bit of nerves because everyone's been delighted to tell me all these scare stories about Mexico and uh, the fact that you'd be safe, but as long as you're out of sight of dark and all these things that, you know, standard precautions when you're in kidnap zones around the world. The dilemma is he's stranded in the middle of a huge dry lake. There's little cover and nightfall is closing in. I'll pedal on for a bit and see if I can find anywhere, but I've got to get off the road in the next 10 minutes, I reckon. Wonder if I can use these shoes, trees for shelter. I'll check it out. No, that's hopeless. It's flooded down there. I'll keep going. There's really not a lot of options around here. I'm a little bit worried right now. It's, uh, Nearly eight o'clock now, and I can't see anywhere to camp. I know it just takes one, you know, wrong place, wrong time, wrong person, and uh, you're in a really serious situation. Very lonely place to be. All day, every day, you know, worrying about uh, what could be very serious situations. Somehow, in the pitch black, 
Mark succeeded in hiding his tent. His night's sleep, however, was less than successful. Uh, no idea where I'm going to get breakfast around here, but uh, I'll try. And to get up and going. From the dry lake of Laguna de Sayula, over the next four days, Mark will drop 4,500 feet before he hits the Pacific. But he's not out of danger yet. He's entering an area where marijuana is the main crop, and the people in charge are the notorious La Familia drug cartel. Violent robbery is common in these parts, and last night, just south of where Mark was camping, a gunfight ended in murder. A way of life the locals are used to. Slightly strangely, but maybe appropriately, <laughs> I've just come across a, a, a roadside, I don't know what you'd call it, like an altar, and uh, there's pictures of what looks like, uh, you know, the Grim Reaper on the outside. And um, apparently this is something which only happens in southern Mexico. And it's the saint of, what, what's it called? Uh, La Santa Muerte. La Santa Muerte. La Santa Muerte. So, so, so this, this is just, this is a southern Mexican thing. And, uh, but it's, it, it's, still, it's still Christian, it's still Catholic? No. No? No, 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 it's, it's just these people who believe in that the saint dead is how they call it. So they pray, they pray to the dead. They, are, they pretend to be followers of the dead. So they're not Christian? They, they are Catholics, yeah. but not Christian. And the Catholic Church doesn't accept this as a saint. Okay. It's just the people. Okay. Just people, especially uh, people who do illegal murders, are who uh, they, they feel like defended by the dead. And every every day, I mean, these candles are freshly lit today. They are. Even the flowers, if you can tell. The prayer to holy dead. Oh, it's in English as well. It is. I want to find I ask for your permission to invoke a holy death. Holy death. Take all envy lack of affection and an unemployment away from me and I beg from the deepest of my heart and charity of your blessed presence to light up my house. Holy death, pray thee our Father. I've never heard of anything like this. And and they leave they leave beer. This is full. They they've, they've opened it. Yes, they just opened them but it's they're full. It's like they believe that the, the saint that is going to drink it, something like that. He likes beer. <laughs> Maybe. It's interesting. It's always interesting to see how people are, uh, you know, reacting to, to, to conflicts and stuff. And the newspapers are just full of the killings. And, you know, when people are uh, making, not, are making sacrifices and leaving, you know, prayers and what not to saint of the dead, then uh, I find that quite worrying. With the dangers preying on Mark's mind, he's finally made it to the Pacific. There it is. Well, my road from Alaska is almost 6,000 miles that way, and that's the last time I saw the ocean, so <laughs> this couldn't be more different, and it's insanely hot. And there's a reason it's so hot. Mark's entering a tropical climate zone. This surrounds Mexico's Sierra Madre del Sur mountains. Blistering temperatures and hill climbs are not the enemy. It's September, which means it's wet season, and that brings unbearable humidity. Oh, I'm not sure about this humidity. It's the... I think it's the most humid I've ever ridden in. I thought Thailand and Malaysia were bad, but this is tough. A bit of a sea breeze would definitely help my energy levels. It's uh, pretty, 
sapping, your head feels like it's going to explode in this humidity. Oh, I get so dehydrated. Following this coastal road down the, the Pacific, it's, uh, I just must be sweating as much as I'm drinking each hour. You've got to be really careful. <sighs> These extreme conditions are forcing Mark to drink more than 10 litres of water a day. At least in the next few weeks, his craving for water is answered every afternoon without fail. Feel that thunder. It's actually quite warm, but um, it's still tough to cycle in. It's, it's so heavy at times it almost hurts, and it really reduces visibility on the road. So, you know, with other cars, it gets pretty dangerous. It also makes it dark so much earlier. You know, it's it's dark an hour and a half before it should <laughs> it should be tonight. I've just made it to town. I've been cycling in this for the last hour and a half, two hours, and I'm going to call it a day. No point in carrying on in this. Scotland, I'm used to cycling in the rain, <laughs> but this stuff's something else. The morning always brings sunshine, and today, a change of country. Mark's been on the road nearly five months and is entering Guatemala, the land of the trees. Well, this is first sight of Guatemala. I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but it's definitely, definitely subtly different to Mexico. This is a nation where the people can trace their ancestry back to the ancient Mayans. So far, Mark has filmed six and a half thousand miles of his journey alone. Quite an achievement while cycling mostly one-handed. For a few days, and a few days only, I've got the luxury of uh, chatting to this camera, or this camera. And uh, so, well, I guess it's like 130 odd days since I saw someone I, I knew in Alaska. So, um, say hi. Go! <laughs> And, uh, well, at least I'm vaguely acclimatized. He's suffering far more, far more than I am at the moment. What the hell? There's no way I can properly blend in around here. Like, look at the difference. I don't look local. Hola. Hola. <laughs> I need some logs in the back of my bike. And I need to be about a foot shorter at least. <laughs> what is this? Come on, guys. Is it easy? He said it's easy. Alex, <laughs> far heavier than what's on my bike. He's got a pile of logs. Ba Argentina? <laughs> no. <laughs> he said he doesn't want to come to Argentina with me. Oh well. It's worth a try. <laughs> This is what I love about this part of the world. I mean, these guys are getting paid to work in a garage, but, you know, there's nothing really to do, so they've got the stereo going and they're dancing. That sums up uh, the feel you get from passing through this part of the world. Everyone's just... They're working, but they're playing harder. Oh, they've got to do some work now. <laughs> That's brilliant. I wish when I went to a garage to fill up with petrol, there was dancing girls to do it. That'd be amazing. The reality is, having a well-paid job in Guatemala is rare. Here, 75% of people live below the poverty line.
With the poor roads, the hill climbs and 6,750 miles, Mark's bike and body have now endured a five-month battering. And with worrying sounds coming from the main bearing of the pedal, it looks like the bike's falling apart first. Luckily, he's tracked down a national Guatemalan race team mechanic to find out if the problem can be fixed. What's, I'm thinking of French and Italian. Uh, it's a, a finito, it's the... The pedal bearing is completely short. For a part that's designed for around 1,800 miles, Mark's abused it for more than three times that. I think this guy's used to working with the national cycling team where they've got a mechanic on hand at all times, so I'm sure he's disgusted that I'm using my kit till absolute uh, breaking point. <laughs> While the mechanic attempts to patch up the bike, Mark needs to think about his own maintenance and find one of the six meals he needs daily. I'm on a journey which is allowing me to see the world in such an intimate way. You can see the warmth of the Latino people in, in, in all they do, in the way they greet you, from their food to their music to their, the way they dress, just to their mannerisms and their friendliness. It's such a different way to North America. Is this possible for one more for me? Yes, it's possible. Is it possible? Is it possible? Is it possible? Is it possible? Yes. So that's a fish. I would definitely eat that, because that's you know, freshly cooked hot in front of me, and there'll be no, there'll be no bad bacteria left there. Great. I've got lunch. I've got lunch sorted. <laughs> she seems thoroughly amused by the whole thing. When you're not feeling at home in terms of not being able to speak the language or really feeling familiar with it all, it's wonderfully um, comforting to, to, to see that and feel that, uh, that warmth of, of spirit. That's fantastic. And you know that's safe, you know, that's the thing. You're trying to find the right amount of food and food you can trust. And for a man from me, food that's not spicy. What's your delicioso? <laughs> With the bike patched up, Mark's mission to cycle the Americas is back on track. Hopefully, if all goes well, I should make it to Argentina without any more mishaps. In less than a week, Mark has cycled across Guatemala and is entering Central America's smallest country, El Salvador. Passport a key? No? Guess not. I'm in. After three days of company, this is where the BBC cameraman leaves Mark to fend for himself. Good luck. See you later. Bye -bye. Good luck on the road. <laughs> As Mark pushes on alone, the wet season and humidity are relentless. There's loads of these tunnels along the coast, and they're actually quite nice. They're a break from the, the midday sun. Some of them are quite long, three, four hundred meters, but uh, yeah, they're a good bit cooler than out here. The extreme climate is the least of Mark's problems. He's about to discover that leaving El Salvador is much harder than getting in. A military coup in Honduras is blocking Mark's road east. The country is under military lockdown and just too dangerous to cycle through. So Mark's headed to a port to see if he can catch a boat instead. Let me know when you have a 
This, uh, this port area has got a pretty dodgy feel about it. Lots of people like this character just coming up and asking for money. And, um, well, I just don't feel particularly safe. You know, a couple of the guys have followed me and uh, I guess I'm going to get out of here. The problem is the ferry sank a year ago and the replacements are tiny boats that don't look fit for the Pacific. I can't find anyone that's running the boats. People tell me that these little boats are crossing all the time. It's a three to four hour crossing. But well, it's blowing an absolute hilly out there. I'm not sure I'd want to be out there. I mean, these things are 25, 30 feet max and little open boats with outboard engine. The idea of cramming a bunch of people on there, having the, the bike and all my bags to watch out for, having to do an open sea crossing in, in winds like this. I mean, you can see the white horses kicking up off the Pacific in the bay there. It doesn't look good. Does not look good at all. It's bad news. A boat crossing is out of the question. He's now faced with a difficult decision. It's a challenge. I'm not quite sure what to do. The British consul confirms it's not advisable to cycle through Honduras. Although still risky, he could get a lift in a truck. It's, it's only about 200 kilometers to clear the country. If I went in a car, just put the bike in the back, I could, uh, I could clear the country in two and a half, three hours. I'm now uh, driving through Honduras. You gotta be flexible in journeys like this and uh, there's no other way to get through safely. After a tense three-hour dash through Honduras, Mark makes it to the border. Glad to be here, because this morning things were not looking good. Looking forward to Nicaragua, third country in Central America, so big milestone. This is the land of the volcanoes. Natural disasters, civil war and dictatorships have left Nicaragua one of the poorest countries in Central America. Here, children often start their working lives below the age of seven. How is it? No, it's a moto. How is it? Él la va a agarrar muy bien. Yo, yo sé el azar también. ¿Está difícil? Sí. Sí. Chico, ahora préstamelo a mí. Ahora yo, ahora yo. Please. Mire, mire. Ok. That is a tough, tough living. Those guys were so young. They told me they were 15, but he looked younger than that. They got a tough life, you know, when you stop at the side of the road, they don't, they don't act like kids. They're not all sort of giggly and shy or sort of, they're, you know, they're, they've already started their work in life. In just over five days, Mark's pushed on through Costa Rica and has arrived in Central America's most southerly country, Panama. With no let up in the wet season, the cycling conditions are appalling and the daily deluge is testing Mark to the limit. Today is the 14th consecutive day of rain. I'm truly, truly sick of the rain now. I knew it was going to get some of the wet season through Central America, but uh, it's just relentless. Day in, day out, wet weather. It's uh, pretty hard to deal with.
And there's worse to come. Mark Spike is broken again. And it's serious. His only hope to save his dream of cycling the Americas lies in the hands of a local bike shop. The, the headset on my bike, which is basically the steering column, the bearings on it have given up. So there's just metal on metal rubbing. So I've got no options in the middle of Panama, this little workshop, just trusting these guys with my bike. Paolo Meta. I'm not involved in the conversation because I don't speak enough Spanish. I don't know. I don't know what they're talking about. It's a bit nerve-wracking having your bike pulled to bits in front of you, and yet again, it's pouring. What an afternoon! I don't like having to take uh, hammers to my bike at all. The fact that they've just taken a bit out of there with a with a chisel. Um. After an hour, and the opinion of half the town, the mechanics triumph. Finish. Gracias, amigo. You are welcome. <laughs> oh, I was so worried when they started hammering away at my bike like that. But they got the job done. I think these guys are used to improvising, so... Brilliant, huge relief. I just need to check in somewhere and dry everything out because uh, yeah. these are tough days at the moment, really tough days. Having battled through bike trouble, the wet season, and survived danger and humidity, Mark has reached a halfway point of his adventure across the Americas. He's been on the road for 135 days, clocked up seven and a half thousand miles, and burnt more than 800,000 calories. And before he heads to South America and the world of deserts and earthquakes, there's time to save him just how far he's come. Just immense. I'll soon be leaving the Pacific and heading up to find the, the start of the Andes and back into the mountains, so near the end of another chapter. South America, here we come. Next time, Mark faces an alien world. This terrain is unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. Soul-destroying winds. No way I can cycle into that hour on hour. The solitude of the desert. It's unique, it's, it's stunning. Emptiness is, is its charm. And his biggest challenge yet, Mount Akinkakyu. Well, the inspiring story of another extraordinary Scottish cyclist next on BBC One, Graham Obrey, who broke records on a bike made from scrap. Johnny Lee Miller stars in the lead role of the Flying Scotsman.